if you want to reduce your risk of diabetes, the key aspects are keeping as uh, healthy weight as you possibly can. So, you know, diet makes a big sense, and you know, you and you probably all the listeners here are well tuned to that, and keeping relatively physically active. Um, and those are the two major things. We cannot stop aging, you know. Um, the one thing I would also say, and I think I've hinted at this, uh, Jonathan, um, I'm now 56. Um, if I can delay developing diabetes till I'm 75, I'm far less worried because if I if my sugar levels start to escape high levels, I, then I don't have many more years for that sugar to cause damage. High sugars immediately do not cause damage. It takes about you know 5 to 10 to 15 years. And also... The older you become to get diabetes, the slower your sugar will elevate because it's less linked to weight gain. The younger you develop diabetes, it's more toxic. It's a more toxic disease because sugar levels rise faster. You tend to have to need more weight. The reason you tend to need to have more weight to court to trigger diabetes is because when you're young, you tend to have a bigger muscle because you're young and your pancreas is healthier because you're young. So in other words, to overcome those um you know, you're better buffering capacity because you're younger. You need to put on, you need to stress the system more by putting more fat in the wrong places. But that comes with it, all the other risk factors. That means your risk is much higher. So you're saying, if I can hold it off till I'm 75, then at that point, maybe you can start to eat the, uh, you could eat chocolate croissant all, off, all day. Is that what, there's other I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. It, but... <laughs> but, 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 but I know that the diabetes then is, is you know, it's but not you're less worried get... about the diet diabetes it's, it's, because it's it not takes... going to it's, it's not going to massively impair my life expectancy if at all it's not going to imp- lead me to have raging eye or kidney disease or nerve disease if at all you know whereas so if if you're in your 40s and 50s and you're in pre-diabetes some small sustainable lifestyle changes that means that you either stay the same way put on a bit of muscle mass or else lose three or four kilograms and sustain that and, and able to keep healthy with a little bit of activity to stop you putting on weight means that you will probably delay developing diabetes for five, you know, three, four or five or 10 years, you know, up to 10 years. And some people have delayed it for a long time or even revert back to normal sugar levels. So it's, it's, it's effectively improving your muscle mass, cutting your weight, ectopic fat, sufficient to de-stress your glucose control mechanisms and Naveed could we talk a little bit about I, I'd love to talk about what you've done yourself and you touched on it maybe briefly but I'd love to understand it sounds like this is a real live risk for you you describe the fact that like both your parents developed it um, when they were very young and it sounds like this is really on your and it just reminds me a little bit of Tim when he's making his own changes for his health like it sounds like this is live for you what what have you how does it affect what you do um you know, I'm obviously fortunate to live, you know, uh, you know, in an area with this an ability to do more physical activity. I think the dog wasn't an effort necessarily to be, to keep my diabetes away, but the side product of the dog is that I am. I've increased my walking much more than I ever did before, and I enjoy it. Um, I've now cycled to work for the last ten years, and I love it. So what I've I've almost I've almost changed my own identity and who I am by becoming more physically active and finding things that I, phys- that I really enjoy. The side product of that is my muscle mass. I can feel it has gone up. Uh, I probably reduced a little bit of excess fat within my liver. 25 years ago, I was a bit heavier and one of my signals for diabetes was incredibly high. And then, you know, and it's come right down um, because effectively it built more muscle, got rid of some of that fat mass. And some of those changes have been very gradual. Equally, I've also made some dietary changes as well, you know, cutting out some of the refined sugars, increasing the variety of the foods I eat, more fiber rich, you know, retrain my palate to have different tastes, which takes a bit of time to get used to. You know, would you believe I even enjoy shredded wheat now? You know, I love shredded wheat, but that's taken me a few weeks to get used to that taste and texture, but I love it. Okay, add two or three grapes on it for a little bit of sweetness, but that's fine. Again, so in a sense, I've been on this gradual step by step by step journey to become a, become a, eating a better quality fuel, having a better quality activity. That's in a sense stop me putting fat in the wrong places, keep my engine better to stop me pushing into diabetes in my forties or fifties. And hopefully, I can keep doing that by staying active, 
to, you know, even if I get diabetes in my late 60s, I'm not worried about it because we now have better, I could undergo a weight loss intervention. I could go undergo this, you know, metformin. There's a, some better drugs coming forward as well. For someone who's listening to this, who already has, you know, type 2 diabetes, or maybe they've been told they have pre-diabetes, um, is it possible to actually reverse some of this? Can you actually lower um, the blood sugars that you were, were were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's, so in every individual, um, we all have a different slope between weight gain and the hemoglobin, the HbA1c level. So in a sense, there's almost a straight line between it, it, each of us, and my line is steeper than yours, Jonathan, because of my family history. So for a smaller amount of weight gain, my HbA once you will elevate because I'll put fat in the wrong places and, and you know da, da, da. so we've shown in the direct trial that if you have a person who's developed diabetes in the last three to four years, if they lose ten kilograms, about forty six percent after one year or thirty three percent after two years no longer have diabetes because they've got rid of fat. The liver fat comes right down. It then the liver responds far better to insulin. The, the liver makes less sugar. Your sugar normalizes in loss. So. So there's a straight line between how much weight people lose and how much well their HbA1c improves, by and large. And, and it works the other way as well. There's a straight line between how much weight you put on and how you Just that slope of that line is different for different individuals based on whether you're male or female, South Asian or, 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 or white, and whatever age you're at, and so on and so on. And so that, that does mean, you know, wherever you are, there is something you can do and it's not just Absolutely. about taking Absolutely. drugs. So I, I had a patient this morning um, in the clinic who has diabetes, who'd undergone surgery for weight loss. They'd lost a lot of weight, their sugar levels had plummeted. You know, they're still within the diabetes range. And the thing I discussed with them was, and they were, they were starting to worry about mobility, was can you actually now increase your muscle mass? You've done, you've lost, and they had lost seven stone because of surgery. But clearly, they could, but they could do some resistance exercise, a bit more physical activity to improve the mobility, so, to improve the engine side of it. So everyone listening can do something, but what they need to do is find something that they can sustain or enjoy to reinvent a new version of themselves that they enjoy and they can sustain for better health as well, whether that's dietary, physical, better sleep, all the things that you've discussed in Zoe and various you know, podcasts. Um, you know, better sleep gives you better appetite, allows you to control your appetite better, more, you know, de-stress, maybe more physical activity, all those things. And try and do it in a way that are either small steps that you can get to um, slightly better health to, to keep some of these diseases away and also to increase the life expectancy of a healthy life, as it were, and contract it, uh, unhealthy life for later years which I think everyone listening to this podcast is interested in. Can I ask one final question before we then get to like the, the, the summary? Um, there are some new drugs that have been in the news like Azempic, and there's been a lot of discussion. Um, we're really lucky to speak to somebody who's one of the world's experts on diabetes. What's your view about these? So now, I, you know, in some respects, I wish we would, didn't need to have those tools, you know, um, because I wish we could change the environment, make it easier for people to live easier lives, because it's not easy changing your diet. It's not easy becoming more physically active. You know, we, we talked about it and, we, and you know, we have to overcome weight stigma. We have to talk about helping people navigate the environment Correct. that they live if you in. Get to, if you're surrounded by awful food. Yeah, it's like, very hard. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. almost impossible. I, I can, so. You know, I don't want people to think that I think it's easy. It's not easy. You know, some of the changes that we've all had to make, we've had to work at them. But even then, for a lot of people, willpower is not enough. The environment they live is not enough. So I wish we did. Having said all of that, there's millions of people living with um, obesity and chronic diseases. These drugs are good, powerful tools that will help people control their appetite, um, lose quite a considerable amount of weight, and therefore reduce and improve and you reduce the risk of a number of chronic diseases, not only diabetes, but more recently, you reduce the risk of heart attacks or strokes, improve um, symptoms and heart failure, reduce the risk of kidney disease, improve the quality of life. So I'm gl glad they're there. They're expensive. We don't have great availability. So we need to work out in all healthcare systems, how do we get them to the people who need them the most to get the maximum benefit from those individuals and society? And that's a big ask. 
And hopefully over the next 10 years, we'll have more of those tools. The prices will come down. They'll be proven to be long-term safe and the benefits outweigh any potential risks. But it sounds like you are expecting to be prescribing these to some people. I've already prescribed them to some people because we have to. But we need to do both prevention and treatment. We can't do just one. 